hours for ESG and ESG CV. My name is Shavana Michaela, and I am today's moderator. If you're just joining us, please go to the chat and introduce yourself with your name and the region you rep represent. As a reminder, this office hour session is being rec recorded for public record. How to ask the question. All questions must be submitted in the chat box. Please type your organization and question into the chat box. The team will read questions out loud at the end of the presentation and will provide answers if possible throughout the presentation. All, and all question and answers into, into the chat box will be recorded as part of the public record. Slides and recording. Both the slides and recording will be sent to all participants within one week of this event. Today's agenda is ESG updates and resources, ESG CV updates, office hours updates, ESG, ESG CV Q&A, Spotlight Series, SAMHSA, Homelessness and Housing Resource Center, and an overview of PATH and SOAR programs. And now I will turn it over to Connie. Thanks, Shavana. Good morning, everybody. Wanted to make an announcement about the 2023 ESG Homelessness Prevention NOFA that we had issued last September 25th. It was issued as an over the counter until funds were exhausted. However, we just amended the NOFA, which should be posted uh, shortly here on our website, that we are going to close this down for applications as of January 19th, so next Friday. So last day to submit an application under this special one-time NOFA is next Friday, January 19th by 5 p.m. Reason is uh, just due to um, a very quick expenditure deadline that's uh, approaching, which is August 7th. That would be the last day anybody that had a contract under this NOFA would be able to expend funds. It's just not enough, not enough time for folks. And just this has just taken longer than we anticipated um, as far as everybody has to have approved homelessness prevention uh, policies and procedures, and that's HCV approved. So again, uh, an e-blast and the NOFA will be amended. Uh, amended NOFA will be on the website shortly. Uh, as a reminder, if this is something that you have an application already in draft, you're thinking about submitting, keep in mind this is not an eviction prevention program. It's not for folks that are literally homeless. It's folks that are housed but at risk of losing housing and they must meet several qualifiers. You must be collaborating with your continuum of care. You must uh, align with the coordinate entry system, use HMIS, and you must have experience in administering a programs, uh, whether it's not this program, but very similar. If you have any crash questions, we always have the ESG NOFA inbox to submit your questions to. Next slide, please. Just a reminder, uh, we're gonna have the slide, you're gonna see this uh, in the coming months and continue to see this in office hours. Still in developing our ESG state uh, guidelines that will replace the ESG state regulations. We hope to have that issued uh, mid-summer, but we will keep you updated on how things are going. And that is all I have for updates. And I'm gonna turn the time now over to Tony. Thank you, Connie. Good morning, everyone, and happy new year. Just a few quick announcements for you. The uh, 22 uh, ESG award announcements are currently in progress. We are almost there. I've got just about everyone taken care of now. I'm keeping an eye on your eCivis inbox for more information if you're waiting. The uh, 2023 ESG annual NOFA awards for the BOS will be announced later this month. We're currently working on that. And um, with that, next slide, please. And as a reminder, we have a number of helpful policy documents in our document library, including policies and procedures, templates, checklists, and other useful tools. So if you have questions, sometimes that's the best place to start with a lot of excellent written documentation for you. Next slide, please. We're also happy to be spotlighting our new video library. This takes the place of the prior video library that, that had been hosted online only now it's hosted on the HCD website. It's just one tab away from the policy documents library. And we continue to work on getting all the videos up there 
and we've made some great progress so far. So please check out our offerings to see what trainees and information are available. Next slide, please. And as always, please reach out to your local ESG representative, Diana Prado, Sam Liu, Giovanni Martinez, Tuesday Cool, and myself. If we can't help you, there's also the NOFA inbox at esgnofa at hcd.cal.gov, which is kind of a catch-all for um, your questions about the ESG program. And with that, I will go ahead and shift it back to Shivana, and thank you so much. Thank you, Connie and Anthony. And now for ESG CV updates. Reminders for performance milestones. CV1 and CV2 allocation agreements expire on December the 31st, 2023. We allocated fun funds allocation must be expended by March the 31st, 2024. Um, this slide will also be in the slide decks that will come out. Reallocate the funds again. Um, the expenditure deadline is 331-2024. Drawdown deadline is 415-24. And agreement expiration date is 630-2024. Upcoming office hour topics. Five years of benchmarking in HMIS in California. ESG monitoring checklist, leveraging and braiding funds. And now at this time, are there any questions into the chat box? No, Shivana, I think we can move forward. Okay, thank you, Chris. How to contact us. If you have any further questions, please contact us. For annual ESG, please reach out to your annual ESG representative or ESG NOFA at hcd.ca.gov. And for ESG CV, please reach out to your grant administrator. And now I will hand it over to Jen Elder, Director of SMAC, SAMHSA, Homeless and Housing Resource. Thanks so much. Hi, everybody. Glad to join you. Thanks for the invite. And uh, also glad to be in good company with the SOAR and PATH presentation next. Just a really great um, SAMHSA uh, day today. Um, so next slide. Um, I'm here just to uh, give an overview of our training and our resources. Um, as said, I'm Jen Elder, uh, I use she, her pronouns, and I'm the director of SAMHSA's Homeless and Housing Resource Center. Uh, next slide. Just a quick disclaimer, because we are a SAMHSA, that just uh, all the views and opinions um, expressed are not necessarily those of SAMHSA or the Department of Health and Human Services. Uh, next slide. So for those who might be new to hearing about um, the Homeless and Housing Resource Center, or as we say, HHRC, because it's much easier to say in that long title, um, we were established by SAMHSA in August of 2020. Um, uh, they, uh, the mission for this was to become like a centralized hub of e easily accessible um, free training for um, professionals in housing and treatment services, um, just to be this, um, be a resource for, for people. We know that there's experts all over the country in these models, instead of having providers go out and have to find all of those trainings. Um, the hope was to bring a lot of great expertise in house. So that's how we, we do it. We have strong partnerships with all of those national experts who contribute their subject matter expertise to our resources. Um, next slide. Um, so one of the, the, the big initiatives that we have are online courses. So currently um, we have uh, six online courses. They're fully accredited from the National Association of Social Workers for CEUs. Those are all free to take and the CEOs, CEUs are, are free as well. There's no cost um, from us for this. Um, we work on releasing two courses per year. So we have six courses already going. We're in year four right now. Um, so we'll release two more. These are great resources, particularly if you have new staff that are onboarding. We know that that can be um, difficult, time consuming to, uh, to train people in the midst of turnover. So these courses are meant to be 
fairly short, but a broad overview. So our longest course right now is the Introduction to Housing Models course that's accredited for four CEUs. But they kind of go down from there. So Trauma-Informed Outreach and Engagement is a three-hour overview, really focusing specifically on um, how to have conversations, how to engage people, real practical implementation of all of this material. We want somebody to take the course and then, you know, go out as part of their job, um, you know, the next day and have some tools to, to put into place. Um, the courses that we're working on releasing this year, I can uh, let you know are um, supporting older adults experiencing homelessness, because we know that's a, a really big need in the field. And our second course will be on hoarding disorders. Um, again, those are both be kind of shorter courses, really honing in on that focus material. And then we also are working on offering our courses in Spanish this year. Next slide. Um, so in addition to that, we have about six to eight webinars um, each year on topics related to homelessness, mental health, and substance use. Um, all of our webinars are archived as well on the website. One of the things that's important to us is featuring peers and people with lived expertise on all of our um, all of our uh, webinars, we, um, especially webinars related to um, substance use, we had a great series recently on um, xylazine and we had individuals, you know, currently using xylazine talk directly about their experiences, because I think we can learn best from those who are um, experiencing it. So we don't offer CEUs directly, but we do have um, certificates of participation that you can get for all of the webinars, even the recorded ones. If you view it, you can um, get a certificate for that. And then um, many accrediting uh, licensing bodies will accept that. Um, all of our webinars as well feature American Sign Language interpretation, live human captioning, and Spanish captions are on the recording. So it's important to us at HHRC to be as inclusive as possible. Um, and we're always interested in ways to make things more inclusive if you have uh, ideas. Uh, next slide. Kind of the, the third thing that, that we've been um, releasing over the past four years are toolkits and resources really informed um, by the needs in the field. It's a wide range of topics. Um, I just listed a few here that might be helpful to, to your work. Fair housing protections, helping with identification documents, um, funding resources, uh, disaster preparation. You know that I've, I've heard from some communities in California who are um, using that disaster preparation guide as a tool to inform just local conversations about um, uh, kind of how to tailor that to your community. All of our resources as well that are written here are available in Spanish. So uh, our work this year to actually translate the whole website and the online courses into Spanish is the last piece that's not available um, in both languages. Um, next slide. All right, so where to start? Um, we are only you know three and a half years old, but we do have a lot, I, I realize, on our website. So we have links here. We created a new staff orientation guide. This is meant to be helpful um, for you as you're onboarding new staff or just looking to deepen skills um, of your teams. So it's divided into subject matter. So if you wanna take a deeper dive into serious mental illness, it will say, we recommend taking the online course in uh, SMI and here's some other webinars that'll be helpful. And, and kind of like so on from there and very you know topic specific training. So that's there just um, as a resource again, everything's just just free and meant to, to be a supplement to the great work you're already doing. Um, also encourage you to join the HHRC listserv. We do have monthly newsletters, announcements of new training, new resources. Um, we like to highlight things from our partners as well. So I've got um, that and our email address if you have any questions. Um, but with that, I think that was probably probably a super speedy overview of everything we have. So if there's any questions from me, I'm happy to help. Yep. So Jen, we do have one question. Um, it's more general, but also just love to just hear your response. Uh, do you have any good resources for in-person motivational interviewing? We've had some folks who are struggling to find that for their case managers. Yeah. Let me 
look real quick, like during the call. Um, and I'll see, because I feel like I, we have one group that we had recommended through our courses, but I'm not quite sure. Because I know we don't do any in-person training like that. But if I if I come across it, I'll I'll loop back during the call. Thanks, Jen. Appreciate it. Yeah. Yes, and Mike, just to be clear, Michael's also asking that of all of our peers here on the call, if anyone has anything across California, happy to have that resource. Uh, seeing no more questions for you, Jen, we'll go ahead and transition the session over to Gordon. Um, unless you have any closing remarks. I don't believe you do. Okay, go ahead, the next slide. All right. Uh, thank you, uh, Chris, and thank you for Jen. Um, Jen said earlier in this presentation that it was a great SAMHSA day. Um, I'm excited that I get to uh, follow up on a SAMHSA presentation with a little bit of information about uh, PATH and SOAR. Um, so a little bit about my qualifications, and I haven't uh, touched on those in a little while, uh, but in a very different life, uh, I managed a statewide PATH and a statewide SOAR uh, program uh, in Wisconsin. And before that, uh, I operated a PATH funded program uh, at the local level. And so this is very exciting for me because one of the things that in the HUD homeless services world that we sometimes miss uh, is that funding and project models exist outside of what we hear about in ESG and COC. And at least for me, uh, both because of my background and because of the demonstrable impact that they have, the place that I go, uh, the moment I look look outside of the the HUD bubble, uh, is straight to SAMHSA because PATH, the PATH program and the SOAR model uh, are so demonstrably impactful. Next slide, please. Um, so we're, I'm going to uh, click us through the PATH program, and obviously the PATH program uh, it didn't have good stock art, so we just went with a PATH here rather than anything to do with the projects for assistance and transition from homelessness uh, uh, stock art. One thing I want to highlight, though, uh, is a distinction that I uh, drew out there but didn't uh, linger on, which is that the PATH program is a formal program, right? There's funding attached to it. Uh, it is uh, allocated in a way that is similar-ish to COC program funds, um, similar-ish to ESG funds as well, uh, but it's it, there's funding behind it. It's a formal program. The SOAR model is not a program in the same way. There is no federal SOAR funding. Um, it is a, a case management model, and it's a project model if it's implemented at a higher level. Um, the other thing that I would highlight is as I talk about PATH, one thing to keep in mind, and I'll touch on this again, is that you can fund SOAR activities using the PATH program. You can also fund SOAR activities a variety of other ways, including with ESG, and we'll talk about that. But the key thing to keep in mind here as we get into it is that PATH is a federal funding source to fund activities similar to ESG and COC. SOAR is a program model that can be funded using PATH and other activities. Uh, and by analogy, SOAR is a little bit like housing first in that it is a best practice for accomplishing a specific goal with a lot of evidence behind it. Next slide, please. So PATH, or the Projects for Assistance and Transition from Homelessness Program, uh, is a federal program. It's funded by SAMHSA. It's funded nationally to all 50 states, to the District of Columbia, uh, and to all overseas territories. In California, uh, PATH funding comes down to the Department of Healthcare Services, or HCS. Um, locally in California, HCS allocates PATH out to counties that elect to participate. Um, I am not familiar with the <clears throat> county level allocation process uh, at HCS, um, but reading between the lines from what's publicly available, uh, it appears that uh, PATH is available to all counties to apply for, uh, and counties that elect to participate means counties that apply for it. Um, at a national level, uh, PATH is about $70 million. Uh, like ESG, it sees incremental increases every year with the federal budget. Um, in California, 
uh, the statewide allocation is about $9 million, was most recently $9 million. Um, and again, I can't speak to uh, how that trickles down to the county level, but that's the pool that you have available. And so at the end of the day, what does PATH do? Um, it serves people with serious mental illness who are experiencing homelessness. <clears throat> It funds services, uh, including outreach, diagnostics, and treatment. Uh, and this is the, the big stinger on this one. It can fund housing, but it often does not. Um, and that's a, a, a sort of more complicated dive. But the short version of it is that PATH at the end of the day offers sufficient funding to do things like outreach, diagnostics, and treatment but that if PATH gets into housing, it has a tendency to be eaten up very quickly by it. And so one of the things we'll talk about in a little while uh, is that PATH rocks, and it rocks at outreach, diagnostics, treatment, and all these other wonderful things. Um, but when it comes to funding housing, PATH is most often useful uh, as one layer of uh, wraparound services that complement the housing for people experiencing homelessness. Next slide, please. So at a national level, uh, SAMHSA defines eligible services to be those that are described on the screen, uh, outreach, screening and diagnostics, habilitation and rehabilitation, community mental health, substance use disorder treatment, referrals for primary health care, job training, educational services, and housing, and housing services as specified in that relevant federal citation, which means functionally housing that looks like PSH. Um, I would emphasize that although all of these are eligible, um, this is a pretty broad hat. And if a PATH program tried to fund all of these, it would not be able to fund all of them sufficiently to meet the need. Um, and that is more true for PATH than it is for certain other programs that have a more limited and specific remit because PATH is so flexible, which is one of its great strengths. Next slide, please. Uh, so common PATH practices, we're talking about what you can do uh, versus what you uh, what you do do. Um, one of the things that I will uh, highlight is that California's eligible services for PATH, as dictated by HCS, uh, are fundamentally the same as the national eligible services. There's not uh, they're worded slightly differently, but my understanding is that they are intended to be the same. And so the national eligible services and your state eligible services are the same. That said. Uh, like ESG, uh, you can, uh, like ESG, you can expect that although uh, there is a federal eligible service <clears throat> offering, the state eligible service offering uh, can narrow it down, but does not choose to. And then again, at the county level, uh, the subrecipient at the county level could choose to narrow services down further. Um, and ES, in ESG, you often do not see that narrowing happening at the county level or at the uh, COC level or the subrecipient level. Um, the place that it's most likely to happen is around homelessness prevention, uh, but for rapid rehousing, uh, emergency shelter and outreach, there isn't usually a narrowing of services. Service providers usually have the full gamut of access. Um, for PATH, there is often this narrowing that occurs, um, and it's usually oriented around whether housing is or is not funded. But let's talk about what PATH usually does. So what you've got on screen in front of you are uh, what we see as common PATH practices. It's not universal, but this is pretty common. You see direct services like behavioral health and substance use treatment. You see uh, diagnostics for PATH and other program eligibility. Um, and a big one here is documentation of disability, uh, which can be a route to eligibility for other programs like PSH. Uh, you can fund SOAR and often do fund SOAR, and we're going to talk about more that more later. Um, referrals and connections to mainstream benefits are really common and part of the outreach component and the referral component. Uh, and finally, in-reach is very common with PATH. Uh, and the reason that I've got that in quotes um, you know, a PATH, I think, struggles with this in the same way that ESG struggles with this, uh, that often PATH 
uh, due to due to funding levels and the level of demand outstripping funding um, and due to just the way people are set up and historical precedent and a million other things, um, PATH is able to conduct outreach, but often it looks like inreach. Uh, and by that, I mean that uh, you'll often see PATH programs um, that have been funded for a long time uh, or that have a really significant uh, imbalance between level of funding and level of need uh, set up like an intake center, often at like a local behavioral health center or a drop-in center um, or another like community health clinic. And they don't conduct outreach, they conduct inreach, meaning that they'll uh, wait for folks to come to them or they might uh, uh, they might conduct like site visits to shelters that are nearby that have large populations. Um, and, and there's value in, in reach in that if you are moving to uh, locations where there are likely to be a lot of eligible people who need to apply, you're going to identify a lot of eligible people who need to apply. The downside is that inReach has a tendency to uh, prioritize for services the people who are most likely to be able to successfully apply. And conversely, it tends to exclude the people who are least likely to be able to apply. And often, though not always, the people who are most likely to be able to apply are not the folks with the greatest level of need. And so having a diversity of uh, outreach practices tends to get the diversity of folks that you're looking for um, across the spectrum of need. One thing the PATH typically does not fund is housing. I touched on this before. Uh, fundamentally, PATH just does not have enough money involved to do the level of housing uh, that its uh, prioritized population, that its eligible population needs. Um, and so at the end of the day, housing is uh, often better handled or handled at all um, by public housing authorities, so housing choice vouchers, but also HUD VASH and also public housing um, and the variety of other housing choice voucher specializations. Um, by COC program funded PSH uh, and by other providers, projects, and programs. Um, this is ultimately a good thing. Uh, PATH is a wonderful complement to all of these other programs. And indeed, the PSH model for COC program came out of marrying uh, supportive services, wraparound services, with housing choice voucher and other public housing subsidies with the recognition that uh, for some people with serious mental illness or serious and persistent disabilities, um, that uh, a voucher was simply not sufficient to help folks achieve and maintain uh, stable, self-sufficient housing. And so PATH uh, can be used to uh, create variations on a model that in the homeless services world, we know as this very specific idea of what PSH is. So next slide, we'll talk about how that can look. So uh, this slide is called Building Better Path Partnerships. And I wasn't really sure how to title this slide because it touches on a bunch of different ideas, tries to get them into five bullet points. And, you know, we could do uh, we could do a day's seminar on this, right? So a couple of foundational assumptions here. Uh, I'm assuming that if you're uh, watching or listening to this uh, presentation, um, that you have uh, some level of decision-making or outreach capacity at a systems level um, within your community, that, you're, that you are within your COC's infrastructure in some way, that you contribute to it in some way at the committee level, uh, as a collaborative applicant staff person, as an ESG uh, subrecipient who's at the table with your COC as a board member, as somebody who is involved with the way your COC moves through the world. And so we're we're examining building better path partnerships, primarily through the lens of how do you uh, reach out to your local path folks? How do you identify them? Uh, and how do you engage them in the broader homeless services response work? Because one of the things that I've seen in many communities is that path can tend to be uh, not integrated or not uh, not tightly integrated with 
other services. And there's a lot of different reasons for that. It's not HUD funded, it's SAMHSA funded. Uh, the HUD folks and HUD subrecipients don't necessarily know about PATH or don't know what, they know what it does, uh, or they're focused on uh, folks with serious mental illness, but they've used that focus through the COC program. There's a lot of different reasons. Um, PATH, and this is really what I want you to take away here. PATH is uh, both an important person at the table, right? Funding source at the table for your local homeless services network. And it's important both because it is dedicated to the work that we're doing and because it's a federal source dedicated to what we're doing, but also it's it's got unique strengths. Um, one of the unique strengths, and this is the one that I like to highlight most, is that unlike uh, anything under the COC program or almost anything under the COC program, and really unlike what HUD kind of wants to see from ESG, is PATH can fund longer term street outreach. And so under the COC program, you can fund coordinated entry SSO projects till the cows come home, but you can't do ongoing street outreach case management. And ESG, you can, but there are limitations on the amount of funding that you can put into uh, street outreach and shelter. And we all know that most of that money goes to shelter. And so at the end of the day, <clears throat> from a federal funding standpoint, we're often left with not a whole lot of money in the street outreach bag. PATH can do that work. And PATH can do that work for people who are living with severe mental illness, who are often a big chunk of our population uh, who uh, need longer term case management while experiencing literal homelessness, and a big chunk of the population who are going into uh, COC program funded permanent supportive housing. And so uh, PATH can do two things here. Um, and this isn't just for people who are uh, living on the streets uh, and experiencing unsheltered homelessness. It's can also be for people who are in shelter, but I'm highlighting the unsheltered portion because it's an unmet need frequently. Um, PATH can provide that ongoing long-term case management. And that's not just about stabilizing people, that's important, uh, but it can also provide uh, housing problem solving. It can fund housing problem solving. And it can fund specifically the rapid exit portion of housing problem solving, which is having these ongoing conversations with people that will often discover routes back to housing uh, over the medium term uh, that you simply will not ID when a person is, uh, when you're first in contact with a person and uh, when they're uh, preoccupied with their very immediate day-to-day -day needs, right? And so uh, having those problem solving conversations funded by PATH uh, can really unlock an option that ESG and uh, the COC program often don't. First, and second, PATH can unlock PSH eligibility. One of the barriers to getting into PSH is having uh, a, a disability certified by a provider who can certify it. Um, and so PATH can fund that, PATH can fund diagnostics. Um, and so having PATH as one of your community mechanisms for getting somebody documented so they can enter PSH uh, can really solve that documentation problem. It can also help solve uh, the chronic homelessness documentation piece as path case managers who are doing longer term street outreach or longer term outreach in general to people uh, can provide documentation for folks uh, who do not have uh, a nice tidy like emergency shelter stay history, for example. In addition, uh, PATH can fund SOAR. Again, we'll touch on that in a moment. Um, SOAR is important because it, it, it fundamentally, it's oriented around uh, getting uh, income for people who don't really have any other option for an income source. Uh, and that income is, is uh, sort of a core part of helping folks return to and retain housing. PATH can also be layered with other programs. So the general idea is that you layer PATH services uh, for people experiencing homelessness with severe mental illness um, with housing from another source, like housing choice vouchers or ESG or COC program. 
Um, the obvious, the most obvious version of this is layering path with a housing choice voucher to create PSH, right? Like you, what you've done there is you've created PSH or rather you've created COC program funded PSH, which is great if you need PSH, but it can be more versatile than that. One of the gaps that I've seen increasingly in different communities uh, is people who are living with severe mental illness who do not meet the chronic homeless definition uh, because they uh, do not have the requisite number of stays. And the community doesn't have PSH that's funded to do dedicated plus. And so there's a gap of people who really need intensive services and like longer term services, but they would only qualify for rapid rehousing. And a way to kind of meet in the middle there is to make what I've seen uh, communities call PSH light, um, where they take ESG funded rapid rehousing or an, another uh, another or uh, another sources funded rapid rehousing like SSVF for example, and layer path over it as services. And so fundamentally, it's time limited PSH, with the understanding that uh, some folks will succeed with intensive services and a year or two years of uh, subsidized housing, and the understanding that some folks won't. And at the end of that stay, you'll have a really easy way to demonstrate that somebody needs something like dedicated plus services because you will have uh, such a long history of delivering the services that folks need that you can demonstrate exactly why this person needs to transition from uh, rapid rehousing into dedicated plus PSH. Finally, PATH really uh, does need to be part of that coordinated community response. Um, I said this earlier, I'm gonna emphasize it again. You know, My first stop, if I were building a COC from scratch outside of HUD would be, I would go knocking on PATH and SSVF store, right? The large funding sources that are federally funded and that are meeting a need that is demonstrably present, veterans experiencing homelessness for SSVF and people with serious mental illness with PATH. So if you don't yet know who your local PATH providers are, I strongly encourage you to get out there, make friends and bring them to the table as they really have a lot to offer you. Next slide, please. So let's talk about the SOAR model. Again, um, nobody had SSI, SSDI outreach stock images. So we've got, uh, we've got an eagle for you today. Next slide. So SSI, SSDI Outreach Access and Recovery, which is SOAR, is a program model and case management approach that helps people experiencing homelessness successfully apply for and receive SSI, SSDI. And I'm going to walk through definitions of these things. I know many of you know them. I just want to make sure that we've got our terms uh, right as we're, as we're walking through and everybody's on the same page there. Um, but before I get into this, I do want to note that SAMHSA maintains actually my favorite website in the world, uh, soarworks at uh, .samhsa.gov, uh, which comprehensively demonstrates everything you could possibly know or want to know about uh, creating a SOAR program, um, implementing the SOAR model, uh, putting SOAR into practice within your existing projects. It's, it's an incredible website with tons of resources, and I urge you to look at it, um, both as an example of how to implement SOAR, but also as an example of how to communicate effectively about your program, as the SOARWorks website is just the best thing I have ever seen uh, in terms of uh, external program communications. Next slide, please. So uh, what are SSI and SSDI? Um, I'm going to note that this is a simplification uh, because, frankly, you don't want to read five pages on this. Uh, but in, as in, in a nutshell, uh, Supplemental Security Income, or SSI, serves people in low-income households, people living with a disabling condition, including severe visual impairment, and people aged 65 or older. Whereas Social Security Disability Insurance, or SSDI, serves people with disability insurance, and people living with a disabling condition, including severe visual impairment. They are similar programs. They're very similar programs. Both are run by the Social Security Administration, or SSA. They both serve similar populations. They differ slightly in eligibility and in benefits levels. Um, but the important thing to know here is that they are both uh, critical income sources for 
people experiencing homelessness who are not currently working or who cannot currently work, and that SOAR, which again, remember, SSI, SSDI, Access and Outreach Model, SOAR, when you when a when a SOAR case manager helps a person apply for SS uh, apply for either of these, SOAR case managers will always help people apply for both in every application to ensure that the applicant receives their maximum benefits and to maximize their chances of being eligible for anything. Next slide, please. So eligibility basics, again, this is an overview. There are additional complications not listed here. For example, um, there you can be disqualified due to a felony or arrest warrant for flight or escape from incarceration, but these are the general boundaries. And if somebody meets these criteria, they're probably eligible. The basic criteria are uh, a person who meets any of the following criteria. They're aged 65 or older. They have a severe visual impairment, which is listed as blind on the SSA website, or they have a disabling condition, which is, uh, which is listed as disabled on the SSA's website. You need all of the following. You need to have limited income and limited resources. Limited is defined further, but it's it, you'll be very familiar with it um, if you uh, are used to uh, ESG qualifications. And you need to meet all of the following other criteria. You have to meet all applicable citizenship and residency requirements, which means U.S. It, in general, it means U.S. citizens and people who otherwise have a legal right to reside in the United States. You are not incarcerated or living in an institution. Uh, that one is a little complicated. It doesn't necessarily disqualify you, though it does uh, not. It, it does pause functionally for the duration of uh, incarceration or institutionalization, and there are certain other requirements as well that apply to edge cases. But for our purposes and homelessness response, we can simplify further. Anybody experiencing homelessness who does not have another in consistent income source probably qualifies for SSI SSDI if they are a U.S. citizen or legal resident who meets at least one of the following criteria, the hearth definition of chronic homelessness, or they're living with a disabling condition, including severe and visual impairment, or, and I should say and or, they're aged 65 or older. If you hit any of those criteria, you're experiencing homelessness, you don't have another consistent income source, and you are legally allowed to reside in the US, you're probably eligible for SSI, SSDI. Next slide, please. So eligibility is not automatic. You have to successfully apply for SSI, SSDI. And this is important because we can talk, I don't know why I keep saying till the cows come home today, but I, I, we can talk all day until the cow co cows come home about uh, eligibility. But you have to actually apply for SSI, SSDI and have your application approved. And there's a real big difference from yes, you're probably eligible and yes, you've been approved to receive it. Um, with ES, and that's true in ESG as well. Um, in ESG, we usually see that gap between household eligibility and approved for project intake. With ESG, the primary limitation is resource availability. We've got 10 vouchers and 30 people who applied. Um, with SSI, SSDI, the primary limitation is a successful application. For our purposes today, uh, you can understand a successful application to mean submitting an application to the SSA that is complete, accurate, and includes all the information the SSA needs to make a decision. It does not mean receiving SSI, SSDI. We're going to talk about that more in just a second. Next slide, please. So this information is from SOARWORKS. Uh, this is about SSI, SSDI applications and approvals. This chart uh, made a convert out of me. This information alone made a convert out of me. This is from 2019 SOAR outcomes. It's drawn from 2019, 2020, uh, because it's the most recent uh, year that we have data from both SOARWORKS and from the SSA on 100% of uh, SSI, SSDI applications being processed. SOARWORKS is up to date through 2022 or three. Um, the SSA is lagging behind because they're still processing appeals uh, from 2021. Initial applications for SSI, SSDI. Without SOAR, only 29% of them are approved. 
I'm going to put that less than one in three people who apply for SSI, SSDI without SOAR are approved. With SOAR, two out of three, more than double are approved, more than doubles on that initial application and more than doubles, SOAR, more than doubles the rate of approval. You see a similar increase on approvals on appeal. So if you're initially denied, you can appeal. On appeal, only 12% of appeals are approved without SOAR. With SOAR, half of them functionally are approved. That is a dramatic increase. Uh, thank you, Jen. I appreciate that. Yep, uh, we are. Yes, exactly. We're we've got uh, 2023 SOAR uh, national outcomes. Um, next slide, please. Uh, we seem to have lost a slide. Hmm. We seem to have lost a slide. So I'm actually just going to talk through it. Um, and I apologize, we will uh, see about correcting that on uh, the uh, publication of it. Um, but there's a uh, slide in here about what SOAR actually does, which is a critical component here. SOAR fundamentally does five things. A SOAR case manager serves as an applicant's representative. They secure the participant's signed authorization to uh, act on their behalf so that the case manager can receive copies of all notices from the SSA, they can communicate directly with the SSA, and they can provide additional information to and obtain info from the SSA as needed. This is helpful because applicants may not have a phone or a place to receive mail. It helps to create continuity. Two, uh, it helps with collecting and submitting medical records. SSI, SSD, SSDI application reviews at the SSA are based on submitted evidence. SOAR case managers help collect and submit medical records as part of the application to ensure that re to ensure reviewers have the information they need to make an informed decision. This is helpful because applicants don't necessarily know what information to provide or in what format to ensure that reviewers have all the info they need to make a good decision. Three, SOAR helps with writing and submitting a medical summary report or MSR. The MSR is a letter written by the SOAR case manager and submitted as part of the application. It provides a narrative overview of the applicant's life and circumstances in a succinct and comprehensive way. MSRs are not necessary for SSI, SSDI approval, but they assist reviewers. Uh, this is helpful because reviewers never meet applicants. Uh, An MSR is a way to tell the applicant's story in a way that clarifies the applicant's eligibility. Four, uh, SOAR helps obtain a co-signature on the MSR by an acceptable medical source. Having a medical source, oh, thank you, Chris, that's wonderful. Um, having, ex having an acceptable medical source co-sign the MSR uh, lends weight to the MSR's authority. This is helpful because it turns the MF MSR from a narrative uh, into a medical opinion, uh, and that obviously carries weight. Finally, fifth, uh, SOAR helps with completing a quality review of applications prior to submitting them. This ensures that applications are complete, accurate, and ready to go. Those of you who work uh, in ESG, which I imagine is all of you, uh, know that applications uh, from participants who are unassisted in submitting them um, really vary in quality, and there's a lot of different reasons for that. None of that is the participant's fault. Um, fundamentally, having somebody who knows the system uh, support the application development and submission process uh, and ensuring that it is complete, accurate, and ready to go um, ensures that the application has its best shot at being uh, approved. Approximately one-third of all SSI, SSSDI denials are due to technical problems with the application uh, that can be caught during a quality review. Um, and having that backstop through SOAR ensures that applica applications are processed quickly and are approved at their initial application rather than on appeal. Um, it, it really just improves the entire process start to finish. Uh, so that's kind of all that I have to say about PATH and SOAR. I know that was a quick overview. Um, I'll go ahead and say uh, next slide or last slide or take the slides on down um, and open it up to uh, questions.
Thanks, Gordon. I'm not seeing any questions this time, but if you do have questions, enter them in the chat, or if you'd like to be unmuted, just let me know and I can do so. And I'm happy to talk through anything from the HHRC or uh, Path Resort today. I'd also say, by the way, uh, for those of you who have Path and SOAR questions that you're not sure whether you should ask or not, um, we do have, uh, I believe we still have Jen Elder with us, uh, and Jen might be an incredible resource if you've got a Path or SOAR question, uh, as while I am relying on my experience in the field, um, I'm, I guarantee Jen has interesting and valuable information to share as well. So if you're sitting on a burning SOAR or Path question, please ask it. I can find the unmute button. Oh, thanks. Um, oh, I thought that was a really great overview. I would just add, I put it in the chat, is um, the SAMHSA SOAR TA Center is a partner TA Center to us, and um, I'm actually a, a, an advisor to that TA Center. So I just put in the California-specific link. Um, there's a national SOAR TA Center liaison, Dan Caldonado, um, who works specifically with California, too. So um, just pointing you to additional people there, but... Yeah, feel free to reach out. We, um, Samsung World, I feel like is small, so we're all interconnected in some way. Uh, I love that. Thank you. <laughs> Chris, you're on mute. Oh, I was going to just say thank you to uh, to our guests today. I think Savannah, we are not seeing any questions. We can probably go ahead and wrap up. Okay, again, thank you, Jen and Gordon, for that informative session. A reminder, a survey will pop up as you exit the session. Please be sure to answer so that we'll know the types of trainings that you are interested in receiving. Again, thank you, Jen and Gordon, and thank you to everyone for attending today, and enjoy the rest of your day.